everyone. How's it going? Good? Okay, we're getting through the day. It's going well. Um, I just want to start off by telling everybody I'm not a clinician. I have no medical clinician background at all. I actually have a background in aviation, and I was uh, actually, I was born in LA but grew up in Seattle and I worked over at the FAA in Renton just kind of down the street a little bit. And that's where I really got started in uh, human factors by understanding the role of aviation and safety and understanding how systems impact performance and how we work. So. Today I'm really going to talk about what human factors is and kind of give everybody a breakdown of what it is and talk about one component by how we can use human factors to understand performance and system safety and system efficiency, which is flow disruptions, uh, which Dr. Kim did talk about a little bit in his presentation. I have nothing to disclose. I'm actually going to start off by telling a story. Is anyone familiar with set phasers on stun? Okay, a couple of people, great. Um, it's a book by Stephen Casey. He also wrote another book called Atomic Chef. If you're interested in error and technology and design, I highly recommend reading both of these books. Um, but this, this example comes from his book, and it's a really great example to talk about human factors and technology and how complex systems can really lead to disaster. Um, but there's a patient named Ray Cox. He's 33 years old. He was going to get his ninth radiation treatment on his shoulder post tumor removal. He was really familiar with this procedure. He was familiar with the radiology technician who he'd worked with several times. And this was kind of a typical normal day for him. He gets this procedure done using a machine called the Therac 25. The Therac 25 has two modes. One mode is a high power x-ray mode which utilizes 25,000 rads of radiation. The way that you activate this mode is really simple. You press x on a keyboard. And when it activates it, it sends those 25,000 rads of radiation through a metal plate. So it's like an x-ray. The other mode is called an electron beam power mode. It's low power, and it's only 200 rads of radiation. When you get hit with this, there's no metal plate involved. You press E on the keyboard, and essentially it's only 200 rads of radiation. Makes, makes sense, right? E for electron beam, X for x-ray, not too complicated. So on this day, like many other procedures, and in this, this hospital in particular, Ray was in the procedure room, and this is my really advanced drawing of what a procedure room versus a uh, uh, control room looks like. The red bar is a wall separating the two areas. Uh, so Ray was in the treatment room, laying on his stomach, ready to get the procedure done. And Mary Beth, a radiology technician who had several years of experience doing this type of procedure, was in a separate control room. This is very standard. It's not anything surprising. Um, she accidentally pressed X instead of E. Not a big deal, it happened. She followed the directions. She knew that what she had to do was use an up arrow key to go switch over to the electron beam mode. So she used the up arrow and then selected E instead of X and she pressed enter. When she did that, the machine configured itself in the X-ray mode, right, the 25,000 rads of radiation, but then told itself, oh, I need to move out the metal plate for the electron beam mode, but I'm gonna keep the power of the X-ray mode. So Ray got beamed with 25,000 rads of radiation. He screamed out in pain. He knew something was wrong, but he just had never experienced this before. So I don't know why it freezes. OK, when this happened, uh, Mary Beth saw a malfunction 54 button pop up on her screen, just a, a box that said malfunction 54. She'd never seen this before, so she entered out of it. She pressed enter. Well, when she did that, Ray got beamed again, okay? So this happened, she saw the button, the malfunction 54 pop up a third time. What did she do? She pressed enter again, and he got hit a third time. When it popped up a fourth time, she said, okay, maybe something's wrong with the machine. It wasn't until she went into the other room and saw that Ray was actually on the floor, off the table, doubled over in pain, that something had gone wrong. So why had this happened? Um, 
well, actually, Ray died, unfortunately, four months later due to massive radiation overdose. But some of the factors that contributed to this incident was the fact that Mary Beth was in a completely separate control room. Okay, she was in a totally different environment. She had no window to see in what was happening. The intercom wasn't working, and the camera had been disconnected. So she had no way of knowing what had gone wrong. Additionally, the technology allowed for her to put in the sequence of the correct steps, but because she did it so quickly, which shouldn't be her fault, she did it efficiently, she did it in under eight seconds, and that caused the machine to malfunction in this way unfortunately leading to Ray's death. And this has happened to several other patients with this particular technology. And it's just a really important example to talk about the fact that technology is really great. We've been hearing these great talks all morning about you know, advances in technology and how they can save patients' lives and they can make our jobs much easier. But it's really important to consider the fact that anytime you introduce new technology or any new equipment into an environment, there's always new challenges that are presented. And we have to have an understanding from a systemic standpoint of how those challenges can affect not only people, but also teams, and even people outside of the OR and how that may affect your performance as well. So how do we go about focusing on patient safety when we hear about these catastrophic events? One way is to be very reactive in nature, and that's what I learned growing up in, in an aviation field. You wait till some catastrophic accident occurs, and then we go backwards in time to figure out exactly what went wrong so we can prevent it from happening again. When I was in the FAA doing an internship, we recreated a lot of accident scenarios. So it was really fun. We got to recreate a situation in an aircraft simulator, and and see exactly what went wrong so we could prevent those things from happening again. And while that approach is really helpful, you know, we do RCAs all the time to figure out exactly where something went wrong, it doesn't really do anything for the person or people who've already been hurt. So one way to do this differently is to maybe have a proactive approach, and that's what Herbert Heinrich suggested. So he did his own study in his um, own industries and looked at industry accidents, and he found that for every major loss of time injury, so for example, someone in his injury slip or someone in his uh, industry slipping on a puddle and cracking their head open, there were 29 minor injuries. So someone slipping on a puddle, maybe twisting their ankle, and 300 no injury accidents. So someone seeing a puddle and walking around it. So he said, why are we focusing on these sentinel major events when we could have a better understanding of what's going on by focusing at the 300 no injury accidents and maybe prevent some of those catastrophic things from happening? So one way to kind of do this and be more proactive is just to shift our focus to the system. So who's familiar with the reason Swiss cheese model of accident causation? Anyone? Okay, are there human factors person? That's great. Um, so this is a really classic uh, framework that's used in human factors and also system safety to have an understanding of how uh, systems can fail, or fail and how we can better understand where errors occur and how to prevent them. So James Reason said that any system typically has four layers or barriers to protect it against threats that are coming in. There's the unsafe acts layer. This is where your errors and violations take place. So if someone breaks the rules and something happens, you can be a failure at the unsafe acts layer. There's also the preconditions for unsafe acts. These are kind of your latent failures that might be hidden in the system that you don't really think about all the time. So how we communicate with each other. There can be a breakdown in our communication, how we coordinate, the layout of the environment, the equipment, the technology that we use. There can be breakdowns in all of these. Supervisory factors, how we train and teach people who work under us or work with us to work effectively. And then organizational factors, so things like our culture and our process and resource management. There can be a failure at any of these layers. And when failures line up just right, that's when a serious adverse event can occur. So we can actually apply human factors principles to identify where these areas of weakness may exist and hopefully prevent serious adverse events from occurring. So what is human factors? A lot of people probably hear about it but have no idea what it is. Um, at Cedars, I'm a, I'm a human factors research scientist, and a lot of people ask me what I do in HR, and I do nothing in HR. Uh, people have no idea what human factors is, so I'm going to break it down in, in a def clear definition for you. Human factors is really the application of scientific knowledge about people to the analysis and design of systems 
so that total system performance is optimized. In other words, what I do is I take all the knowledge that I have on humans and how they behave. So I use um, lessons that I've learned in sensation and perception, neuroscience, behavior, memory and cognition even understanding why humans like certain colors, and helping to design systems that are designed better for the human rather than shoving a human into an imperfect system and getting mad when we make mistakes or errors occur. We all behave in certain ways and we have certain biases and we think in certain ways and we have to make sure that a system is designed well around us. Why should we shove a human into an imperfect system and expect us to learn from things that we can't help but not control? So I mentioned that it's all about designing a system. This is the systems engineering initiative for patient safety. It's basically uh, a model for what a work system looks like. Any system typically has five factors. You have humans that interact with other humans using certain technologies and tools to accomplish certain tasks in given environments within a certain organization in different organizational components and rules. That is what typically makes up a system. So what I do is I go in and I try to identify where are the issues in the system and how can we better design them for the human. Oftentimes we'll see that you know we're working with technology that isn't perfect. We're working with an environment that isn't the most optimal environment for us to work within. So how can we redesign those areas to make them more effective and efficient? So one way that we can get a sense for how our systems are functioning is to research these things called flow disruptions or workflow disruptions. Flow disruptions are basically just process inefficiencies or distractions or disruptions in a system. A textbook definition is that they're deviations in the natural progression of a task, thereby com potentially compromising the safety of a task. Really, it's anything that while you're in the operating room that could affect you or your team members and distract you at least in any amount that could potentially compromise your ability to take in new information. Flow disruptions have been found to actually increase mental workload and the likeliness of surgical errors. So they're kind of this really nice way to test the temperature or to take the temperature of your system. When you're in the operating room and you're operating and someone next to you takes a phone call, you're still able to operate fine. You're not likely to make an error, but at least some of your attentional resources are allocated to listening to that phone call that's happening. You may not be actively attending to that phone call, but if something some really big important piece of information comes in that you're supposed to pay attention to, and part of your attentional resources are allocated to listening to that phone call, you're not gonna be as prepared to take in that new information that you need, and you may be more at risk to make an error or to miss some really important information. Flow disruptions can extend into all layers of the system. They can involve communication issues, so we may not communicate effectively. The layout of the room. I can't tell you how many operating rooms I've seen with tons of wires and tubing draped across the floor that we just expect humans to walk over. And most of us are really good at that. We're really good at workarounds. But should you have to worry about carrying a tray of instruments and having to step over wires and tubing in an OR? I don't think so. A lot of us do it every day, but it doesn't mean that's how we should make our environments work. Flow disruptions can also be involved in the technology and tools that we're using. So if you have a piece of equipment that is really hard to make function, that could slow you down as well and make the environment less safe for you and the patient. It's important to note that flow disruptions really aren't major events that immediately um, or directly impact surgical performance. Like I said, you might be operating and continue operating just fine, but they serve to kind of reduce the compensatory resources of you and the surgical team. And flow disruptions can impact anybody. So they're just a really good way to have an understanding of how your system is functioning. There's a lot of different ways that people measure flow disruptions in surgery and in different environments. I've used pretty much all three of these taxonomies. There's other ones. Taxonomies are basically just ways that we can categorize what it is that we're seeing. Um, and I'm gonna go through a few examples so you can understand what does it even mean? What are we looking at? Why do we care? Um, but this is just kind of a good way for everyone to understand what the theory is behind this practice of using flow disruptions. So if you decide in your organizations that you wanna test the temperature of your system and just kind of identify these disruptions, you can use any one of these taxonomies. You can also create your own. So you can just come up with buckets of categories that you think these disruptions would fall into that are most relevant to you. 
So now I'm just gonna spend a few more minutes just kind of giving you guys examples of what flow disruption research and surgery looks like. Um, I know here we're talking about spinal surgery, but um, I'm gonna give you some examples from all different areas, just so you can understand how vast this research is. Um, so in one study, we looked at flow disruptions in cardiac surgery. Just to give you an example of how many we see, in 15 procedures, we saw almost 1,000 disruptions, 878, um, across all the different individuals in the room. So we were specifically looking at what types of disruptions impact the surgeon, the circulating nurse, the anesthesiologist, and the perfusionist, particularly. And we found that these 878 disruptions took 18 hours and 24 minutes to resolve. It doesn't mean that 18 hours and 24 minutes of time was totally dedicated to these disruptions. It just means that at least part of someone's time during surgery was spent having to, you know, maybe go get a piece of equipment that was outside of the room or dealing with people who couldn't communicate effectively. And what we found is that interruptions or things like phone calls going off, um, unnecessary personnel coming in and just chatting, uh, tended to make up the most of the disruptions, and, and that's not surprising. In another study, we actually really wanted to look at this this theory that we call the error space, which is basically just associating a time with the flow disruptions that we're seeing. And our idea is that the longer that you spend attending to these types of disruptions, the more at risk you are for having an error. So we call this the error space, essentially. The longer you spend dealing with flow disruptions, the more at risk you are for some important information to come in that you might miss. And again, we found that not only did interruptions have the highest frequency, but they also took the longest time on average to resolve. So about 66 seconds when we looked just at the surgeon in cardiac surgery. So these are from um, a separate hospital looking at 24 procedures with just the surgeon to see what types of issues that they were seeing. Um, my colleagues have also looked at robotic surgery and the way that flow disruptions impact individuals in robotic surgery. And this study is really interesting because they looked at the flow disruptions that they saw with residents and without residents. And expectedly, the, the cases that had residents had, a, had some more disruptions in them. And I'm sure some of the attendings in the room can, can attest to this or have an understanding that when you're taking the time to train or teach, you may be slowing down, you may be having more questions or more communication that's going on in the room. Again, flow disruptions aren't necessarily a bad thing, they can just help you have an understanding of you know, where some inefficiencies may lie in the system. So there are significantly more disruptions associated with training, obviously, um, when there were residents in the room versus when there weren't. It's pretty similar numbers in terms of equipment and um, other things like that. And then they also kind of dove even deeper and they looked at what specific elements of training had to do with these flow disruptions. And they found that most of them had to do with procedure specific questions, um, instrument instruction and robotic surgical ins um, instruction. And you know, in and of itself, it's, it's really helpful to have an understanding of what elements go into training that may possibly disrupt the flow of surgery. Because perhaps you could take some of these teachings you know, to the sim lab, perhaps you could make this process more efficient in surgery or give people more lessons outside of the surgical room so that you're not impacting your ability to stay on task or to be in flow while you're operating. So it's just really helpful to have a baseline understanding of kind of what, what's the temperature of the system, where, where are the inefficiencies. And then finally, the one that's most related to you guys, um, again, this was, this was done by our colleague Ken Catchpole, and he looked at um, flow disruptions in image-guided spinal surgery, and he did this in a really interesting way because he looked at the flow disruptions that were impacting not only the surgeon but also the image guidance tech, and he also broke that down even further to understand, well, are there are differences between experts and novices, and what he found was that in either case, whether you're a surgeon or a technician, if you're a novice, you're more likely to experience more of these disruptions, and especially with respect to coordination and equipment issues. So it's really helpful to know that as you gain your skills and as you train, um, you're less likely to experience these types of disruptions. So it can be really helpful to understand that when you're transitioning from um, a novice to a more expert in your field. 
So this was really just an overview of human factors and flow disruptions work, research and work. And it's really exciting because you can use this work to make proactive changes in your healthcare system, in your operating rooms, based on just really these small process inefficiencies rather than waiting for something catastrophic to occur. You can look out the layout of the environment and say, you know what, it's interesting. We had to walk around the edge of this bed 30 times and someone almost tripped over a wire six times and maybe we'll just move the, the patient bed north in the room. You can make changes that will have really important lasting effects without causing harm just by looking at something, one small element of the system, which are flow disruptions. So it's a little bit different than what we've been talking about today, but I hope that gives everyone a good overview of what human factors is and, and the role of flow disruptions, which is just one small aspect of of human factors. So that's all I have, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Thank you. Yep.